Section one. You will hear a conversation between a university counselor and two students, Joseph and Kara. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Joseph. How are you today? Fine, thanks. And Kara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study, and how you are managing your time. Okay? Yes. I think so. Okay. So I'll start with Kara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socializing? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Kara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects. And picking it up again next year as a minor, you have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about ten hours more than the average student a week. Think about it, and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at eleven thirty. Okay, good. Come to my office at eleven forty-five and wait in reception. Okay? Okay. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socializing through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So you've managed to integrate well. I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall, I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up, and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late. No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised, and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work. Okay? Yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend ninety percent of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before, and well, we went out afterwards, and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, 
I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super-fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouille, our all-around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The Crankset has a 4234 combination, running an 18 toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900, or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. The Saluki is our roadish, light-touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead, because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. 
We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two students, David and Claire. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, David. How are you going with your history studies? Very well. I've actually finished it. That's great! What era did you write on? I researched Roman London, something I never thought I'd be interested in. That sounds interesting. I wanted to tie it into the work I've been doing on engineering, and I found it fascinating <laughs> and learned many things along the way. Such as? Well... Although there were prehistoric settlements throughout the vast area now called London, strangely enough, no evidence has yet been found for any such community at the northern end of London Bridge, where the present city grew up. The origins of London lie in Roman times, right? Right. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they moved north from the Kentish coast and traversed the Thames in the London region, clashing with the local tribesmen just to the north. It has been suggested that the soldiers crossed the river at Lambeth, but it was further downstream that they built a permanent wooden bridge, just east of the present London Bridge, in more settled times some seven years later. As a focal point of the Roman road system, it was the bridge which attracted settlers and led to London's inevitable growth. So, London Bridge has been there for hundreds of years? Yes, and though the regularity of London's original street grid may indicate that the initial inhabitants were the military, trade and commerce soon followed. The London Thames was deep and still within the tidal zone, an ideal place for the berthing of ships. What other industry did they have? Well, as the area was also well-drained and low-lying, it was geologically suitable for brick-making. There was soon a flourishing city called Londinium in the area where the monument now stands. Londinium? That's Latin. That's what I thought too, but the name itself is Celtic, not Latin, and may originally have referred merely to a previous farmstead on the site. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 32. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 32. Wasn't London burned to the ground at some stage? It happened in AD 60 by the forces of Queen Boudicca of the Iceni tribe from modern Norfolk when she led a major revolt against Roman rule. The governor, Suetonius Paulinus, who was busy exterminating the Druids in North Wales, marched his troops south in an attempt to save London, but, seeing the size of Boudicca's approaching army, decided he could not mount an adequate defence and evacuated the city instead. Not everyone managed to escape, though, and many were massacred. What about the beautiful old architecture? Did you research that too? I sure did. The major symbol of Roman rule was the Temple of the Imperial Cult, Emperor worship was administered by the Provincial Council, whose headquarters appear to have been in London by AD 100. A member of its staff, named Anencletus, buried his wife on Ludgate Hill around this time. Pagan worship flourished within the cosmopolitan city. 
A temple to the mysterious eastern god Mithras was found at Bucklersbury House and is displayed nearby. I quite like St Paul's. Traditionally, St Paul's Cathedral stands on the site of a temple of Diana. Other significant buildings also began to appear in the late first century, at a time when the city was expanding rapidly. The Forum, a marketplace and basilica which housed the law courts complex at Leadenhall Market, was erected and then quickly replanned as the largest such complex north of the Alps. The Forum was much bigger than today's Trafalgar Square. Who was in charge of all the town planning at the time? Procurator Agricola. He encouraged the use of bathhouses and had a grand public suite made, which is now being excavated in Upper Thames Street. They were as much a social venue as a place to bathe. There was a smaller version at Cheapside, and in later centuries, private bathhouses were also built. Another popular attraction was the wooden amphitheatre, erected on the northwestern outskirts of the city. It's possible that gladiatorial shows were put on here, though lesser public sports like bear baiting may have been more regular. I thought that happened mainly in the Colosseum in Rome, but I guess London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about A.D. 200. The administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior, and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about twenty foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure, which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus. Tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about staying healthy in university. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-three to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-three to forty. Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms. Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organize your time around studies and socializing, but you can socialize while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon, or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. 
There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis, and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium with a variety of programmes, such as aerobics and weight training. If the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative or speak with sports administration manager, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. Now, I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial. Physically and emotionally, the obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life, as women are prone to osteoporosis. It also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.